CGTN, China Global Television Network. Despite some signs of hope, the world still remains in the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic. The world is also dealing with the seemingly accelerating pace of climate change. From vaccine nationalism to environmental impact, Africa has borne the brunt of this crisis. Organizations such as the UN and the World Health Organization have joined South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa in pushing for a lifting of COVID-19 vaccine IP rights. Yet, as we head into year three of this pandemic and the world is in the grips of another variant, there seems to be a little movement on this front. The Climate Summit in Glasgow brought little back in the form of climate finance, which is key for developing countries looking to turn green. Africa has been hard hit by the climate change crisis. Extreme weather events such as floods and droughts have battered the continent. In matters of security and politics, 2021 was a roller coaster year for the African continent. From coups across West Africa to conflict breaking out in the Horn of Africa, it was a year of major shifts. Yet, a new leader in America and a UN General Assembly meeting that marks the return of a multilateral system battered by several years of European nationalism. A reassuring partnership with China in the fight against the pandemic as the CPC celebrates its centenary and the year ends with a FOCAC summit in Dakar, Senegal. On this week's episode of the program, we look into existing challenges caused by the pandemic. We take a look at the economic and security situation on the continent, as well as the impact of climate change. So what lessons will Africa take from 2021 as it embraces yet another new year? And what can the continent expect in 2022? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Let's now bring in our panel of experts all joining via Zoom from Johannesburg, Dr. David Monyae, an international relations and foreign policy expert. In Beijing, Professor Xia Lu, Associate Professor of School of Marxism Studies, Renmin University of China. In Bangui, Dr. Ngoi Nsenga, COVID-19 Incident Manager for the World Health Organization's Regional Office for Africa. And in Mombasa, Kenya, Mustafa Ali, co-founder and chairman of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies. Gentlemen, a warm welcome and thank you very much for joining in on Talk Africa today. Uh, Dr. Nsenga, if I may start off with you, it has been quite an eventful year. Many still unexpected uh, things have happened. What's your take on uh, the key moments that stood out for you in 2021? Of course, the, the key event, the public health wise, is uh, the COVID-19, which we're still battling and which will, I, I believe will continue uh, even beyond 2021 and maybe even beyond 2022. Uh, that said now uh, that we have tools, at least we have tools, and by tool I mean especially the vaccine, even though the distribution of the vaccine globally uh, is not what to expect, but I think in Africa we are also uh, making progress, even though the progress are still very, very uh, slow and the progress is still very low in terms of vaccination and reaching all the people. But I believe we are getting there and I also believe that if there is nothing else which compromise the vaccination, uh, which I'm thinking here about new variant, right. I think will also uh, in Africa get rid of, of uh, COVID uh, when it comes time. Dr. When time comes. Dr. Monyai, the key moments have stood out for you? Uh, there were a lot of um, uh, moments. Uh, as my colleague has mentioned, the COVID, which is a negative, uh, played a, a negative part in Africa's development. But there was also a positive element of the very same COVID-19. Uh, for the very first time, we saw uh, Africans really working extremely hard, united, uh, presenting a, um, a regional front in terms of buying of vaccines, um, speaking with one voice. I think there hasn't been any year that Africans spoke loudly uh, in terms of demanding fairness at a global level and exposing the unfairness in which the continent is um, treated. Um, we have also have had a number of coups on the African continent uh, this year, more than any other year. 
uh, in the recent past. Um, and this was also followed uh, by um, change of government, uh, particularly in Zambia. We saw the coming of a new uh, opposition leader uh, taking uh, power. Uh, and we also have had um, a continent that uh, is moving uh, forward on its infrastructure development right. uh, and more so in partnership with strategic partners. And of all partners, I think China has uh, come out as the most important uh, in terms of figure, uh, the number of investments, um, the assistance and the donations, including uh, the recent announced um, 1 billion uh, vaccines, 600 uh, million donations and 400 jointly um, uh, production with Africans. So right. these are some of the most important events uh, in my view. Uh, Professor Shia Lu, your thoughts? Actually, when we look back uh, 50 years ago in 1971, actually it was, uh, or it were the African countries, the friendly countries that, uh, you know, introduced the kind of resolution into the United Nations that restored the legal seat of the People's Republic of China. Ever since 1940s, the UN was established. So I would like to say that in the year 2021, this event marks the milestone between the relation between, uh, I mean, uh, between the relation, uh, in, in the relation between China and the African uh, continent. And the second, uh, we also know that uh, uh, in, in, last, uh, in early, early this month, uh, there was a kind of a, a ministerial uh, meeting uh, between the African countries and China. That was uh, a forum on the China-African cooperation. And this year's kind of the meeting focused on the uh, uh, strengthening or the improvement of a rural area and also the poverty alleviation. So uh, I would like to argue that the poverty alleviation would be the focus of the, uh, the, the, the next couple of years between uh, China and Africa. Dr. Must Mr. Mustafa, your thoughts? Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, this year, 2021, really was a mixed bag uh, here in Africa. And uh, uh, some of the highlights, good points, is the in some areas there were you know, increasing democratization processes in Southern Africa. Uh, 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 you know, people electing their government. We saw an opposition uh, party and uh, a leader coming up to take to win the presidency in Zambia. Um, so generally, more legitimacy in 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 uh, uh, in the democratic uh, processes here. Uh, multilaterally, uh, we saw um, more multilateralism. China. Uh, uh, Africa relations, strengthening and focusing on what really matters in terms of uh, building infrastructure and connecting the African continent so that there is increased trading between countries uh, um, of Africa. Th these are some of the highlights. Uh, of course, not forgetting that there was a robust uh, uh, engagement, uh, mobilization to address COVID, which on the whole, um, has not affected the African continent as much as it has affected Europe, for example, Latin America, uh, 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 in, 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 in terms of um, uh, uh, health. Um, however, the economy of African continent, uh, uh, even though there were these developments, positive right. developments, it was hard hit by COVID-19. Dr. Nsenga, so let's look at this uh, event that uh, many have uh, talked about that defined most of 2021, the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccines. Now, according to the World Health Organization, Africa has fully vaccinated about 77 million people, just about 6% of its population. In comparison, over 70% of the high-income countries you know, have been vaccinated. Why is the uptake in Africa so low? Uh, in Africa, as of today, we have now vaccinated, when I mean vaccinated, fully vaccinated, which means uh, for two doses, for those vaccines that need two doses or for one dose, for the vaccine that need only one dose like Johnson & Johnson. So as of today, we have vaccinated 115 million uh, people fully vaccinated. Uh, which represent about 8.4% of the population, total of uh, African population. Now, that's one. The second one is, uh, let us also uh, not paint Africa in the whole one color as, as usual. Uh, Africa actually is many countries and they are different and they are at different level, even including in, in terms of vaccination. 
as we speak in Africa today, at least 26 countries, they've consumed uh, more than 50% of the vaccine that they have. And that uh, at least uh, seven countries have completed more than 40% uh, right. of fully vaccinated people, including uh, some of the countries at more even about 79% of fully vaccinated people. Now, that said, that said, you're absolutely right. When we compare Africa as a whole and other region, yes, Africa is vaccinated less than the other region. And there's a very clear reason about that. Right. The reasons, some of the reasons are the, the, the following. One, you might remember, Beatrice, that Africa, we started the latest. I mean, long later than other countries and other regions. That's one. Second, of course, is availability of vaccine. I started here by giving the number of vaccine that right. some of the countries or African countries have used. That said, is still true that African countries have not received the amount of the vaccine that is requested. And let us also be clear that we are still having, in some of our African countries, we are still struggling with operations or challenges. All That's right. also true. And of course, like in any, kind, in any other country, in any other region, we are also facing uh, ch the challenge of uh, vaccine hesitancy. All those elements brought together explain why Africa so far, we have, uh, we, we have vaccinated less than other regions. Right. But I, I have to emphasize the availability of vaccine is one of the major reasons. Uh, Mustafa, you, you talked about the coups and the democratization of the continent, but uh, we saw in 2020, though, that terrorism and violent extremism were arguably the biggest issues of uh, security challenges facing Africa in 2020. How did Africa fare on that front in 2021? Indeed, Beatrice. Um, in 2021, uh, violent extremists and terrorists uh, increased uh, their attacks on innocent civilians, on governments, on on, on uh, uh, on state actors. And uh, if you uh, write from the uh, uh, West Africa, across the Sahel to the Horn of Africa, to Eastern Africa, to down South Africa in Cabo Delgado in, in, in Mozambique, we saw more brazen attacks by uh, um, uh, groups affiliated to Al Qaeda, the Islamic State's uh, 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 provinces in Central Africa, in, in, in West Africa. Uh, uh, became much, much more active, perhaps taking advantage of the COVID situation on the continent. Um, and uh, specifically in Somalia, we actually saw Al-Shabaab for the first time collecting more taxes than the government uh, uh, in Mogadishu. And they actually took more territory as that government continued to, to falter because of the um, legitimacy issues. Uh, government, uh, they're supposed to uh, have gone towards an election early this year, but have not done so. So we actually see uh, terrorist groups taking advantage of such, such situations. The re-Talibanization of Afghanistan inspired many terrorist groups in Africa. And this is uh, what we are going to watch very carefully in 2022, if governments are going to take more robust action to ensure that terrorists do not hold more ground that they already are in 2021. Dr. Nsenga, I do want to come back to you. How is Africa, what are Africa's chances of a rebound in 2022? What will it uh, take for you know, Africa to have its economic success and to overcome this COVID-19 situation in 2022? One thing that Africa keep on surprising the world is the African resilience. I mean, uh, you might remember that at the beginning of this pandemic, everyone, and I should confess, including WHO, we were predicting a catastrophe for Africa uh, uh, based on, the, uh, on what was happening in other regions and other countries. But fortunately, that catastrophe did, did not happen. So I still believe that Africa's resilience, including, I'm not an economist, but I still believe that African resilience, including a social economic resilience will continue. Even though, even though, again, we have to recognize that unfortunately, Africa will continue to be uh, hit hard by, 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 by the pandemic. But let me also say this, uh, it's not only Africa, actually. Uh, uh, as long as even a single country in Africa or elsewhere or anywhere else 
is still affected by the virus, it will be the whole world that will be still at risk. So we are in the same in the same boat. I mean, people should not uh, make a mistake. They should not make such a mistake. We are in the same boat. Is right. either we sink together, or we save ourselves together. There is no any other way out. All right, Mustafa. I do want to hear this from you before I let you go. You know, do you feel that Africa ended on a high or on a low? What should Africa have focused on in 2021? Did we miss the boat? You know, it's, as I started, it's a mixed bag. We, we we got some things right. We were helped by, by, by the resilience that we have experienced and witnessed this year. We need to do a lot better. The Horn of Africa right now is faced by serious turbulence. Ethiopia is going down. Eritrea is still in, uh, in, in a box. Uh, Somalia is going down. We saw coups, several coups in Sudan, in Niger, in Mali. So these are some of the areas, uh, particularly in governance, uh, uh, stability and security that African countries will need to focus a lot more in the coming year. All right. On that note, let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have more on Africa in 2021 and expectations for the coming year. To stay with us. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue our discussion on Africa in 2021. Still with me from Johannesburg, Dr. David Monyai, and joining me from Beijing, Professor Xie Lu. Thank you for staying uh, with us today. Well, Dr. Munyai and uh, Professor Liu, I want to continue our conversation on multilateralism. Uh, previous speakers have talked about the re-energizing of multilateralism in 2021. We saw the U.S. beginning to re-engage constructively in multilateralism after President Biden uh, took office. Uh, Professor Shea, what is your view on reshaping multilateralism in 2021? Actually, the multilateralism is not only in the critical uh, situation or the critical crisis facing countries in 2021. Actually, uh, the multilateralism, or we can say the lack of multilateralism, actually has or has been the critical crisis or critical issues for countries, for all the international community ever since the end of the Second World War. So we can see that uh, not only during the Cold War, but also during the post-Cold War period, uh, still some certain countries uh, wanted to, you know, um, uh, ignore or neglect the multilateralism that has already become the, uh, more and more the trending or that has already become more and more uh, feasible and uh, more and more a realistic situation for all the uh, members of the international community. So in my opinion, uh, in the future, the uh, challenge to the multilateralism come still, still comes from the um, I would like to say the former hegemonic countries, they still, uh, they still want to you know, rely on the previous experience, the previous, let's say, the, um, uh, the experience and other kind of institutional arrangement for their, um, for their uh, dealing with uh, uh, the new situation. Well, that would be the challenge for the multilateralism and that would be the challenge for the entire uh, uh, community of mankind. All right. Uh, Dr. Monia, your thoughts? I concur with my colleague. Uh, since 1945, uh, the kind of multilateralism was based and remains so based on the governance by very few elite countries, uh, Western countries in particular. Uh, as it stands, Africa does not have uh, representation 
uh, within key and strategic uh, forums within the United Nations, particularly the Security Council. And therefore, I think it is at this stage that uh, Africa would call upon uh, its strategic partners such as China and other countries in the global south to ensure that multilateralism is enhanced, uh, to ensure that there is democratization of multilateralism with fairness, uh, inclusivity, and ensure that um, the voices of Africa and other parts of the world are at the heart of it. And furthermore, there is a question of new issues that have come up. We talk about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, there's a, a need to bring new uh, rules and right. regulation to govern um, cybersecurity, as well as uh, the issue of uh, dealing with technologies uh, to ensure that there is fairness uh, in how we operate in a new world order. But how do you see, though, uh, Dr. Monyai, how do you see China and Africa working together in the future to strengthen multilateralism? I think there's a need for coordination uh, and continued support in various um, other forums that um, African countries work closely with China. Um, for instance, within WTO, um, and this year we saw African representative are heading that institution, and therefore China's support was critical. And then I think we still need Chinese uh, support within uh, the G20 um, and within BRICS and, and other important forums where uh, China ought to defend African position uh, in those uh, critical. And similarly, the African continent needs to come to Chinese um, assistant, um, particularly on issues such as the forthcoming Olympic uh, Games that are starting um, next month, um, and other areas where China is treated unfairly. So it will be a win-win um, defending each other's interest, right. as was the case in the past. So, Professor Shia, the, the Communist Party of China also in 2021 celebrated uh, its 100-year uh, anniversary. You know, the CPC has been very central in the development of China and has provided, you know, a learning point for uh, other societies. How do you see China's ideologies uh, shaping the world into the future? Well, when talking about the ideology of the Communist Party of China, people uh, would tend to see or will tend to say that uh, Okay, this might not be. This might be uh, socialism. This might be communism. And when, when people talking about the communism, people would, uh, you know, might think some kind of strange thing. But but that's not the case in China. Actually, uh, uh, we can see that in the past uh, four decades or four uh, 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 forty years, more than forty years of the reform and open up in China, the Communist Party of China actually followed a very practical ideology in terms of uh, economic development, in terms of uh, social management, social governance. And also in terms of uh, promoting the whole process, the people's uh, uh, people's democracy. So we can see that um, um, uh, learning from the uh, 100 year struggle of the Communist Party of China, we can uh, generally uh, uh, highlight the, at least the three points of the ideological kind of uh, points. The first one is uh, uh, everlasting innovation. So the Communist Party of China is now 100 years uh, uh, in terms of age. However, it is not an old party. It is a uh, a young party and it is an energetic party because it, it's always kind of challenging itself by uh, innovating itself innovate so the theoretical innovation and the practical innovation is the key word a second one is that um, um, uh, the, the communist party of china has always had a long-term goal a long-term goal right. not only for the next year but also for the next five or ten years that's the second one the third one would be people-centered orientation people-centered ideology this this three point actually uh, could be kind of uh, uh, the uh, learning point for the uh, other uh, society all right uh, dr munya even as we talk about um, how multilateralism has been re-energized in 2021. Let's look briefly at um, Africa's chances with uh, climate change because Africa's main issue at this year's uh, uh, COP26 was really about climate financing. Uh, but even where climate financing is available according to adaptation and mi mitigation policies, though, Africa and developing countries have had a, a bit of a challenge in accessing the uh, financing. Why has the issue of accessing climate financing become complicated if the world is talking about 
coming together about uh, multilateralism? Uh, it's a simple answer that one has. Um, what we have at a global level is an apartheid uh, climate change uh, narrative. Um, we have Africa, Africa in particular, uh, it hasn't played any critical role in destroying our environment. As a matter of fact, it is at the receiving end of centuries of mismanagement of the environment by Western countries. But at the moment is that most countries in the West have developed so much and they've reached a point as much as Africa supports the issue of climate change and the need to change to clean energy, the level and the pace in which it should be done, it is becoming more and increasingly unfair. Um, Africa is told to leave coal immediately uh, and go into clean uh, energy. Right. And that it is unfair as advanced by China and India. You have to do it in a gradual way uh, and ensure that Africa develop uh, its own technologies. Uh, Africa also manages to deal with uh, unemployment in those sectors that are affected by coal. Uh, and therefore, I think going forward, there is a need of coordination and ensure that Africa plays a critical role in climate change, but at the same time, advancing its own development, avoiding a situation where climate change is used uh, to hold back Africa's own development. All right. So I want to get a final comment from uh, you both. And uh, Professor Shia, let me start with you. Looking back at 2021, what are your expectations for 2022? First of all would be the safety of our humankind. So uh, we are kind of avoid the um, avoid the more casualties in, uh, by the uh, COVID-19, uh, this uh, virus. And then the further development should be uh, strengthened and the further kind of uh, uh, trust, uh, uh, mutual trust should be strengthened and improved among all the countries, all, all the members in the international community. All right. Dr. Munyai, does Africa have reasons to be optimistic? What are your expectations? Yeah, indeed, we have the youngest population. And as you can see, um, education is becoming a critical area. With all the negative news we've had, I think you see Africa marching forward, uh, working with a number of strategic partners, including China. I think we're going to see the same trend uh, increased Africa interaction with the traditional partners, the European Union, United States, Japan, and uh, working hard on the existing um, wonderful uh, relation with, with China. And we're also seeing an awakening on the African continent. It's no longer the continent of the past. Um, we see uh, development in technologies on the African continent, uh, highly learned Africans uh, all over the world, and therefore the AU will continue to play a critical role to deal with conflict, and we're looking forward to Africa's industrialization. And, uh, and therefore, 2022 will be a wonderful year, in my view. And what an optimistic note to end uh, the year with, and that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts in Johannesburg, Dr. David Monyai, international relations and foreign policy expert. In Beijing, Professor Xia Lu, associate professor of the School of Marxism Studies, Renmin University of China. In Bangui, Dr. Ngoi Nsenga, uh, the country representative, World Health Organization, regional office in the Central African Republic. And in Mombasa, Mustafa Ali, co-founder and chairman of the Horn International Institute for Strategic Studies. But remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter. And you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. To join us again next week for more uh, Talk Africa. For me, Beatrice Marshall, happy holidays and a happy new year.